In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. The Gospel today, my beloved, is uh, the third week of the Pentecostal, uh, or the Holy 50 Days. Um, and of course, as we know, uh, the first Sunday after the Feast of Resurrection dealt with faith, which was Thomas Sunday. Last week was the second week, which dealt with what? What did it speak about? The bread of life, and today is the living water. Um, during the Holy Great Fast, we focus on our repentance and our returning to God as a symbolism of, our, symbolism of our life on earth. It's this constant struggle against sin and purifying ourselves through repentance. During the Holy 50 Days, the Church takes us to heaven and wants us to live the heavenly life from today. So in heaven, we will eat of the bread of life and we will drink of the living water. Um, and so that's why the sequence of it is, is at it, as it is. We eat of the living bread and we drink of the living water. What is the living water, though? I'll read a few quotes from some of the church fathers, uh, and you'll see there is you know, a, a similar line of thought and belief among the fathers. Uh, St. Augustine says, The living water is the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is given to those who believe in Christ, and which becomes in them a wellspring of life. So he says the Holy Spirit is the grace of the Holy Spirit within us, and its not its function is not only to transform us, but to become a wellspring to those around us. So the idea is what that he'll fill us with the Holy Spirit. So when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, this pours over to the rest of the world, believers or not. Saint John Chrysostom says um, he promises the water of spiritual doctrine, which makes those who receive it and keep it within themselves stronger than death. So St. John Chrysostom says this living water is the right doctrine. The right doctrine, which is with it being right, it is able to uh, defeat uh, even death. It's stronger than death. Basically saying that it is truth. Truth is what has victory over the lie and over death. So St. John Chrysostom says that this is the true spiritual doctrine. This right doctrine which is able to save a soul because the wrong doctrine can you know be the cause of a soul to perish lastly saint cyril of alexandria our father he says the living water is the grace of the holy spirit which transforms the soul and renews it making it capable of participating in the divine life so he says this is the grace of the holy spirit within us in which we are capable of living this divine life or participating in the divine life this is why in order, like in, in the uh, Orthodox Church, we baptize the infant and then we give them the unction of the Meirun, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So they're then capable of living and participating in the divine life from a very young age. We don't deprive them of this uh, grace. So to, in summary, the fathers, they look at this living water as the gift of the Holy Spirit given to you and to me. This grace of the Holy Spirit that we give, that we have, and this living water that we partake of has power. And I'd like to speak about just three points this morning about the power of the living water that we receive in the Holy Spirit. The first power uh, of the living water is the transformative power. It has the power to transform. Of course, um, uh, to transform our life. If you've ever been like um, in a place where it's like desert and you're really, really thirsty, and it's almost like when you're really thirsty, you have trouble walking and moving and to the point where you want to just stop and sit down. And as soon as you take a sip of this water, it's like you're rejuvenated. You're given new life, right? You drink of this water and you're able to continue and keep going because you've hydrated yourself and you're able to continue. This living water in the same way has a, has a way of transforming one's life. If you consider the Samaritan woman, in the passage that we read today, this is what happened. It changed her life. And actually, the, an interesting thing, you know, and every time you read this, I read this passage, I, I discover something new. Uh, when you listen to what the Lord Jesus was telling her, as soon as he got out of her her confession, she's the one who changed the subject about how and when ought one to worship. As if this is what was troubling her and this is what was on her mind. So it wasn't like she was like, you know, this horrible person that had nothing to do with God and didn't even consider it. No. 
Because once that she knew that he was special, that he might be a prophet, she talked about what was in her heart, which was how and when one ought to worship. Um, so her dealing with him, and when she received this water, she actually partook of the water, the living water, and she didn't even know it. Because she came, and then she said, okay, give me this water. But there was, and then she said you had nothing to draw with. So she really took nothing from him physically. Right? She didn't, he didn't take the well, water from the well, then blessed it and gave it to her as a symbol of the living water. He didn't do that. But he gave her a taste of himself, and he gave her this living water, this grace of the Holy Spirit that transformed her life. She went there, and uh, you know, she was embarrassed, and she left an evangelist. So how is it that this water can transform my life? I'll give you, you know, uh, there in the first three verses of the Pauline epistle that we read today from Colossians, give us a small hint. In uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he says what? If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So the first way that we can transform our life through the grace of the Holy Spirit is to seek where Christ is. To seek where Christ is. And where is Christ? Christ is in heaven, right? So seek the place where Christ is. Do I want to be in his presence or not? And maybe we can always, we all will answer, yes, I want to be in his presence. But maybe let's flip the question and say, will Christ be in my presence? Will Christ be in my presence as I'm sitting in front of my phone looking at the screen? With my friends talking, will Christ be in my presence? When I'm at home dealing with my family, will Christ be in my home? Of course, Christ will be here in his home, but will he be there in our home? Does my home reflect the serenity, peace, and uh, prayerful life of the church? Or does it resemble something else completely? Will Christ be comfortable in my home, in my life, in my gatherings, sitting next to me while I'm on the computer or on my phone? Seek where Christ is and uh, keep in mind that he wants to be where you are. Also, we can consider, am I annoyed um, by churchly talk? You know, sometimes we sit in our gatherings and then somebody brings something, you know, beneficial to speak about, about our salvation, and then we get the eye rolls, and then you get the, oh, we got to talk about this everywhere. You know, again, am I comfortable? Do I enjoy being in Christ's presence? When somebody brings somebody something spiritual that they read, am I finding comfort in this, or do I find annoyance? And I'm aggravated. And let's stick with the second. Let's talk about the politics. Let's talk about stocks. Let's talk about money. Let's talk about possessions. This is what I want to talk about. Seek where Christ is. Set your destination. Where am I going in my life? The second thing we find in the second verse. He says, set your mind in th on things above, not on things on the earth. So set your mind on the things above. So the first was set your mind where Christ is. The second is set your mind on the things that are above. Meditate on things from heaven's perspective. Meditate on things from heaven's perspective. How do the heavens look at this circumstance? How do the heavens look at this circumstance? What is the response of heaven when I repent? We know what, that there is much joy in heaven over what? Over one sinner who repents. So when I go and I go to sit and uh, I'm waiting to sit with my confession father to say my sins and I'm nervous or I don't want to tell him things, think about what is heaven's perspective of me sitting at the door. It's as almost like they're going to have a surprise party. Right when you go in there and you begin to confess, they're going to be joyous. They're on the edge of their seat waiting for me to confess. It brings them joy. This is heaven's perspective. My perspective is I'm ashamed. I'm, I don't want to say anything. Should I tell him everything? Should I not tell him everything? I'll just you know, go and chit-chat with Abuna and this will be my confession. This is, the, this is the earth's perspective. But let's look at things from heaven's perspective. What about um, the angels, right? We all, as we know, we have guardian angels, right? This is heaven's perspective. Look what uh, St. Uh, Shanud the Archimedes says about this guardian angel. He says, let it be beyond doubt that every one of us, male or female, young or old, 
who was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, has been assigned a designated angel until the day of his death to report to God every day uh, what his assigned individual has done by day and by night. So we all have a guardian angel. And everything that we do, whether good or bad, is reported to God, right, by this angel. This is heaven's perspective. This angel is a heavenly being. So when I do an act of selfless service to someone, this angel goes with joy to heaven and reports to God, look what your son and daughter has done. They have turned a person from a sinful way. They've comforted somebody when they're in distress. They were patient with someone who is angry or upset. And on the contrary is also true. When we live this double life, and when we curse someone, and when we maybe mumble under our breath things that we shouldn't be mumbling, the angel takes this up with disappointment and reports it to God as well. This is heaven's perspective. This is heaven's perspective. The third way we have this transformation um, is in verse 3. He says, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The third way that the Holy Spirit transforms us is to bring to our remembrance that we died. We died. The old man is dead. And notice here in the verse he says, for you died. Is that past or present? Past. Can anybody alive say that they have, have used de di like being dead in the past tense? No. So when he says here you died, it's inferring what that you are still alive, that you've resurrected, right? So it's saying what here? Remember that you died and now you're alive again, right? You died, like baptism, is death and resurrection with Christ. So you died from the things of this world, the sin and all the pleasures and all the things that keep us tied to the world, you're dead from that. And you're alive again to Christ. <clears throat> in, the, um, in Africa, in uh, some of the tribes, they have something called monkey soup, right? They like eating monkeys or something like that. Like mulkhaya, but with monkeys. Actually, and then it's arenib, right? With the rabbits in Egypt, they like rabbits. So it's kind of like that, but in Africa, it's monkeys. So do you know how, do you know how the monkeys, they're extremely difficult to catch. How do you catch monkeys? You can't catch them. So you know what they do? They get a coconut, and it's hollow in the inside, so they drill a really small hole, just enough so that the monkey can stick his hand in like this, right? Then they put inside the coconut, they put um, pineapple and rice, what the monkeys like, and they put it inside the coconut, and on the other side of the coconut, they tie like a chain or something, and they tie it like to a tree, right? So then they, and then they leave. And they come back, and what happens, you know, after they leave is the monkey smells the food. They go in, and they put their little hands inside the coconut and hold on to the food, and they try to take their, take their hand out. But because they want the food so much, they keep their hand like this. So what happens in the morning when the people come, the monkey's still trying to get his hand out. He won't let go of the food to get his hand out. So all they do, they put a bag on the monkey's head, chop off his hand, and then they go have their monkey soup. It's pretty bad for the monkey itself. But what is the moral of the story here? If I can't let go, if I can't let go, I'll, I'll be like, I'll be dead. Like, you'll cut off the, our hand. As long as we're attached to something in the world, we we'll, won't be like, uh, uh, have, be able to have this transformation. So we have to remember that we died. Right, we have to remember, okay, this part of me is cut off. I need to live with my focus on heaven. Live with my focus on heaven. <coughs> Lastly, he says, in, uh, and the, the fourth way is, is um, uh, he desires we appear with him in glory. This is in the, the verse 4. He says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, when you also will appear with him in glory. So he says, when Christ appears, you will also appear with him in glory. And this is exactly what he told us in John chapter 17. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying to the Father. It's exactly what the Lord Jesus said. He says, in the glory which you, the Father, gave me, the Son, I have given them, us, that they may be one just as we are one. So he wants to give us his glory. And this ought to transform my life. You know, if I were to say, if you live a certain way, and you dress a certain way, and you speak a certain way, you will be given a kingdom with a crown, with gold, and a palace, and all of this. And you won't have to work to get it. We will do it. 
why we, we can labor, and it's worth millions and millions of dollars, right? I can work my whole life and not even make one million. But then if I can just do these few things, I can have something I would never dream of having. This is exactly what Christ wants to give us. Something we would never dream of having is his glory, but then he makes it, he doesn't make it unattainable. He makes it very attainable, very attainable. <clears throat> he desires that we appear with him in glory. So this should uh, transform our life. Okay, maybe the way that I'm speaking to somebody, I can try to change it. Maybe the way that I'm exposing myself to different kinds of media, I need to be able to change this, right? It's better to not be exposed and be in the dark about these things and be ignorant about these things than to know them and then this will plague us for many years or the rest of our life. Then when my life is transformed, the life of those around me will also be transformed. It's quite amazing. You know, one of, this is one of the benefits of being like a priest is that you see how the Lord works in people's life. And one of the most beautiful things to see is a person's transformation. And not only that, but how his transformation affected his family. It went from like a family that is kulaha naked, right? To now to a family who is overjoyed. The children are happy, the husband is happy, the wife is happy, and they live in this peace and enjoying God's presence in their family. It's a beautiful transformation. And everybody benefits from my transformation. And this is the key. I need to focus on my transformation, not the transformation of others. When I'm transformed, then this will be a wellspring to, for others to be transformed. <clears throat> the second power of the living water besides transformation is the power to tell the truth. The power to tell the truth. It was very embarrassing for this Samaritan woman to admit that she was w married five times and the one she has was not her husband. It's very embarrassing. And perhaps when we read it, there was no pause. But maybe with her there was a pause thinking what I should say. Should I go into detail? Should I just keep it simple? What should I say? Maybe there was a pause. And then she said simply, yeah, I have no husband. And do you think, you know, living uh, with six, you know, men, honesty was on her top priority? Honesty was probably not her top priority, right? But now the Lord is giving her this living water, which is the Holy Spirit. And what do we say about the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of truth, right? We say this in the, in the Feast of Pentecost and throughout all the Apostles, Spirit of truth, right? It's the Spirit of truth. So when the Spirit is within us, it drives us to say the truth. And she's tasted this truth for the first time when she uttered, I have no husband. The Holy Spirit, my beloved, gives us the courage to tell the truth. Sometimes it's very convenient to lie and to bend the truth to my liking, to manipulate the people around me or to hide the things that I want to hide. But the Holy Spirit can give us the courage to say the truth, to say the truth. Not only to say the truth to others, but to say the truth to myself. To say the truth, to be honest with myself of who I really am. I, I think I'm a good, kind person because this is what I present to people. But inside I'm an angry person. Inside, I'm a hateful person. In inside, I'm a lustful person. Inside, I have these bad thoughts. To be honest with ourselves. St. John tells us, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us. We lie to ourselves. But with the Holy Spirit, gives us the courage to t tell the truth. And once we experience this and we tell the truth, it's very liberating. It's very liberating. It's freedom. And you shall know that the truth and the truth shall make you free. When we experience the beauty of being truthful and honest, we have nothing to fear. People say, okay, well, when I'm truthful, people will know my weaknesses and they'll know my vulnerabilities. So what? Do you think everybody doesn't have a vulnerability or a weakness? We all do. We all do. And if somebody thinks that they don't, they're fooling themselves and they're lying to themselves. Because we all have this vulnerability and this weakness. Because we're all human, right? But the idea is I need to know it in myself. And when I know it, and if somebody knows it, yes, that's me. That's really who I am. That's it. That's it. It's very free. You're liberating. I'm able to admit even my weaknesses to my brethren. This is okay. But this is where we begin. This is where we begin to grow. 
Lastly, the power of uh, this living water lies in the power to preach or to evangelize. Did this Samaritan woman have any theological background? No. Um, so what is it that she shared? How did she evangelize? All she simply said was, come see a man that told me all that I ever did. Come and see the person who showed me who I truly was, who revealed to me my sins, who allowed me to be truthful to myself. Come, let me show you this one. And they went. And they went initially because of her, but then they believed because of him, because they heard and saw him, because he stayed with them for two days. Her life-changing experience is what she shared. St. Paul, would we say he was very theological? Absolutely. He was a Pharisee. When he went to go preach, did he preach all, the, all this theology? When he wrote, he did. But when he went to preach to the non-believers, all he told them was about his experience with Christ on the road to Damascus. That's why in the book of Acts it's mentioned two, two times. He recalls his account on the road to Damascus twice. This is my encounter with Christ that transformed my life. This is what we need to share. This is what we need to share. This transformation, this is what people are looking for. When you say, okay, well, I was living this way and I was miserable in my family, but then, and I knew God and I was a Christian and everything, but when I started living this way, this transformed my family and my life and my children. This gives something, the people around us, something concrete. Something concrete. It's not just theory, but it's concrete. This is how Christ changed my life. And this is what's compelling. We hear there's a flood of information about Christianity and, and everything. But when is it that you run into somebody who was transformed by Christ and then they give you some advice that maybe I can apply to transform my life? This is the wellspring of this water flowing to those who are around us. She, the Samaritan woman tasted the living water and wanted to share it with others. The Lord said to the disciples um, when he was sending them out not to worry about what they would say. Because this is something. Maybe we say, okay, well, I'm going to go and share the gospel. What am I going to say? Look what he says. He says, now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. By any means, this does not mean we should not, uh, uh, or that we should abandon spiritual insight, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. It does not mean this. We do these things, and then we give the Holy Spirit, you know, inventory within us to work with. If I have no Bible verses, no knowledge of the Bible, no knowledge of the church, no knowledge of, and of anything, then what is the Holy Spirit going to work with? There's nothing to work with. But the more that I fill my mind with spiritual things, knowing the Bible, memorizing the Bible, learning the stories of the saints, all of these things then this gives the Holy Spirit something to work with. So then when it comes the time that I need to witness, I'll recall what the Holy Spirit wants me to recall, and that's what I share. We feed ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to recall those things in the time of need. And we can pray together, and we say, Lord, allow me to taste the Holy Spirit that you have given me, that it may be a source of living water in me, to give me this power of transformation, give me the power to be honest with myself and to be truthful with the people I live with, and lastly, to preach and to share the life-giving message that you have entrusted me with. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.